started. So our uh, next talk is uh, building a data pipeline framework for the cloud. And uh, we have Jacob presenting uh, that talk. He is a full stack software engineer with experience in containerized deployment, data pipelines, and cloud platforms. And you moved from Miami to San Jose, is that right? I did. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so we have people coming from all uh, far away places over here. Uh, so over to uh, Jacob. Cool. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm going to try and I haven't held a mic in a minute, so I'm kind of doing this. Um, how was everybody tonight? Great. Good? Okay. The food was really good. Thank you. And I want to say thank you for hosting and organizing this. Um, it's really appreciated. Um, so my name is Jacob. I am a software engineer. I live in Santa Clara, recent transplant from Miami. Um, and really hoping to get out there and meet some people. I feel like I'm just coming out of a cave after a while of working on Masher. Um, so I'm glad to be here and see friendly faces. Um, so Masher is an open source project that I had the rare opportunity to just kind of work on uh, on my own uh, while I was uh, in a planned unemployment period. Um, and uh, it's an open source data pipeline orchestration and monitoring framework. I'm going to get into what that means and what its particular use case is, because data pipeline use cases just about could be anything, um, and, uh, and talk more uh, about it and design choices and stuff. Um, so in order to do that, I'm going to talk about what Masher is at a very high level first, uh, and then just do some brief overview. So like, what are our data pipelines? Why am I even talking about this? Um, and what is the use case that Masher seeks to fill in particular? And then what are the challenges of going about creating your own data pipeline? Uh, and then some of the solutions that are out there, because there are many, uh, for, for creating a data pipeline, for abstracting away some of those things so you don't have to worry about everything. Uh, and then finally getting into the design and challenges of building Masher and how it does that. Um, so first, I think I just said this, but Masher is, this is a high level overview. It's an easy to use data pipeline orchestration and monitoring framework for small applications, which allows you to take data from multiple sources and combine it so that you can use it. So you got data sitting around a lot of different places. It's a pretty common scenario. Um, uh, you have data sitting around from a lot of different places. You want to bring them together into one place so you can perform analysis or do something else with it. Um, so Masher is a CLI built in Node.js and published as an NPM package. You can go and use it, download it now. Uh, it launches resources on Google Cloud Platform, uh, and it uses Docker to host a tool called Embolk. Has anybody heard of Embolk here? Oh, cool. Um, so that's helpful. Um, Embolk's cool. I'm going to get into it a little bit because you do need to know about it in order to understand Masher. Um, and Quick show of hands, who here has used uh, like AWS in the last year? Who here has used GCP in the last year? Okay, okay that's good. So, um, I love GCP uh, and uh, I'm, I just, it's a good show of hands to know how I should map the services over as I'm talking. Um, so the first thing is that Masher only launches these resources to build a data pipeline. Right now on Google Cloud Platform, we would love to make it uh, uh, deployable on multiple platforms. Right now, this is what we support. Just felt like we're excited about GCP uh, first and excited about a lot of the robust machine learning and analytics tools. And there's a couple other reasons I could get into at the end if there's time. So first, just what are data pipelines? Um, so obviously, a data pipeline at its most simplest is just about getting data from point A to point B from a source to a destination. But as you know, there's actually a lot of complicated steps in between that comes up, depending on the kind of scale uh, and quantity or volume of data that you're moving, uh, and what kind of steps in between, how complicated they are. Um, so for our use case, for Masher, there's a, there's a pretty particular use case that we're looking at. You're a developer for a small application, and you've got data sitting around a bunch of different sources, maybe a PSQL database, maybe other applications, REST API, maybe MongoDB, 
And you need to take data from multiple sources and combine it so you can use it. So uh, more specifically, let's say we're, we're like a niche book app, a uh, book selling app. It's just a web app, sells books. That's what we do, um, right? And your developers were on this, pro on this project. You're, you're building out the application and you, uh, you have been entrusted to build a data pipeline that takes data from different sources and puts it somewhere. So for instance, maybe you have uh, an Amazon e-commerce platform and MailChimp and you want to pull data from each one of these, put it into one spot so you can see how your email marketing compares with your sales. Pretty straightforward and pretty common use case, right? Um, but uh, let's see, yes. So you want to put it all together. So the first thing that you might think of is like, all right, well, I'm just going to have a virtual machine and I'll have a little application running and it's going to uh, pull data from an API and just send it to BigQuery or something like that. BigQuery would be uh, GCP's data warehouse. Um, so it would be pretty straightforward, but the reality is it's a little more complicated than that. So the first thing is that what if MailChimp um, adds a new field to their responses uh, that you get back? Well, in that case, when you load that data into BigQuery, BigQuery will fail. The load job will fail because it's now the schema has changed. And so now anything that, any data that comes in with a different schema than what you wanted uh, won't successfully load. Um, or maybe you want to keep a record of successful load jobs. Maybe you want to do that because uh, you can debug the, you can look in the raw data to look for um, any corrupted data along the way, or for audit or compliance reporting or anything like that. Um, so in that case, you're not going to want to just put it into here. You're going to want to step in between. And then usually you're going to want to do some kind of transformation or validation on the data. So maybe you want to make sure if there was a financial database that you're pulling from um, that has data from the last year, maybe you have a validation step that says, um, that uh, you know the date, this field should be a date field, only valid dates within the last year, or transformation, maybe you need to do something to that data before it reaches the database. And then finally, in this use case, we're bookend, mm -hmm. the niche book selling app. Um, you know that you're small, but you're growing. So you're gonna add new sources all the time. So you need some sort of modular or plugin based way that you can add new sources of data without a lot of overhead and rewriting each time. So, so if we've got all of that together, this starts to get a little bit more complicated than just doing uh, simple API calls, right? You need some stuff in between. Um, and so that's when maybe we start thinking about data pipeline and some core components of a data pipeline that we would want to be, uh, that we would want to have uh, for our use case. So really it's like, what are, the, what are the best practices that we would want to employ in building up this data pipeline? So the first thing that seems self-evident but has some hidden complexity is that there's usually going to be some sort of extraction component. Um, you want to extract data from the source. The data may come to you in JSON or XML uh, or CSV. You need some way to format it into a way that the destination database can read. You're probably going to need to host this somewhere. Um, and additionally, you're going to have some sort of schedule service, right? It's going to pull data at a regular interval. So it could be a cron job or maybe you're on a cloud platform, use their like, uh, cloud scheduler for GCP. You want to provide validations. Uh, I was just talking about that. Uh, you're going to want to, most, more often than not, you're going to perform some kind of transformation on that data. So you might be encoding freeform values. That would be like mapping male to M uh, or female to F or translating coded values. So you could be uh, mapping zero and one to M and F. And then as I was talking about before, you're usually not gonna wanna just send that data directly into the destination database. You're gonna have some place in between that it's gonna live. And that's for uh, audit reports and compliance, but mainly for the last two failover, by, by which I mean failing load jobs, being able to go back and, and debug uh, failing load jobs, as well as debug uh, corrupted data. Uh, and then another one with, uh, that's self-evident but with some hidden complexity is the method in which you're going to load data. So a lot of cloud, provide, cloud platforms are going to have um, right, like uh, batch loading, which is just one chunk at a time, or they're going to have a streaming service. 
And so knowing which way you're going to do based on your particular use case. For every step of, uh, of your data pipeline, you'd want some sort of monitoring enabled. And that's that extraction component, that's staging and archiving, the validation and transformation, the loading, so that you can go back and see, uh, you know, if your data pipeline was the cause of the corruption, corrupted data in the first place. Um, and, uh, and so you'd want some sort of way to know uh, what data was loaded, uh, errors if any, what action was taken. And then these last two, orchestration and performance, apply a little bit less to Masher's use case because we're not thinking about a larger and complicated scenario. Um, but for larger workflows, uh, just the ordering and orchestration of tasks can become really complicated. Um, so uh, conditional or dependent tasks, um, and thinking through those particular steps that you would need for your, your use case. Um, and then performance, most performance issues that you might run into at this scale are going to be bottlenecks at the front or the back when you're extracting data. Maybe there are read limits or throttles from an API or, low, or write limits to a database, um, and that's where you find most of them. Um, so you got all of that figured out, and you want to think about the order in which you're going to, um, going to build your data pipeline. So ETL, common, common phrase, extract, transform, load. This is the traditional way of thinking about a data pipeline, and that was really because the cost of storing data was um, larger than it is today, and so you'd want to do transformations beforehand, like uh, aggregation that might reduce the amount of data so that you could uh, load in less data. But today, uh, the cost of storing data with cloud platforms and other tools is much lower, so, we have, uh, so sometimes we might do transformations after the fact and just put everything into the data warehouse of choice. So those general components that we're looking at, right, data extraction component, staging and archiving, transformation and validation, and then data loading, this is the general components that any, any good uh, data pipeline should have. Um, so we're building this. So, so, so two things to note there before moving forward is just sort of, well, that's a, that becomes a lot more things you have to think about for this small web application to go about building that data pipeline. It suddenly becomes more complicated than just setting up something that does some simple API calls. Um, and so a common place we might look then is thinking about well, what tools are available uh, from a cloud platform. And so as I was saying, Masher supports Google Cloud Platform right now. Um, and, uh, and it turns out, right, when you think about cloud platforms, uh, when I think about cloud platforms, um, it is a wonderful thing that they abstract away so many tools and provide so many resources that you couldn't otherwise use. And at the same time, they're extremely complicated. If you look at uh, any, any of the dashboards, there'll be a thousand different services. And if you're gonna build something out, you have to know enough, not only about um, the things that might be data pipeline specific, but anything that is peripheral to that so that you can make an educated choice about what tools that you're gonna use. Um, so overwhelming number of configuration options um, and, uh, is one of the first issues that you'll run into in thinking about it. And, and just for this, research on researching what tools, what resources we would use for Masher can tell you like data transfer service, data flow, uh, cloud functions, are you gonna host it on a virtual machine? Um, or, and then they just put out Cloud Run while we were doing this, um, which is really exciting, would have loved to have used. Um, right, so there's a bunch of different services that you'll have to research and think through before you can get there. Uh, client libraries may not be complete, so we found that uh, there's a no, there was no node client library for Cloud Functions, which is the equivalent of Lambda. And then many tasks are actually comprised of a series of smaller tasks and decision points. Um, right, so if you're, you want a virtual machine, great, what OS, what disk size, you want, you want to do storage, uh, which one? And so it ends up being that actually um, using the cloud platforms while it abstracts away a lot can also actually add a lot of work as well. So just as an example, Masher uses 23 different API calls and, and just the main ones we use seven different uh, services. So that's why there's a lot of solutions, because it's actually kind of complicated to set these up on your own, right? Um, and those solutions are, are really varied. So I, we, I break down like the solutions into two different groups. There's 
hosted, which by that I mean like proprietary solutions, and then self-hosted, which is like open source solutions. So hosted solutions, um, you've got everything from Power Informatica, which could be six figures, to things like Stitch and Fivetran. Has anyone used one of these? Or one of these here? So Stitch and Fivetran is like a drag and drop UI. Pretty cool. So in, their, in the use case that we're talking about, it would make sense to think about something like this. Um, so you would click on a source that you get, put in your credentials, and then you would click on the destination, and that's about it. It would think about all of those other things, like monitoring, archiving, and backup for you. It's all abstracted away. Um, so those pros of using those services are that, right? It's all abstracted away from you. You don't have to worry about it. Um, it manages it for you, and it's going to be really quick uptime. There's no setup. You don't have to learn a new tool or anything like that. But the, the, the two main cons are privacy and control. And privacy, right, the data is now going to sit on someone else's servers, right? It's going to sit on Stitch's servers in this case. Um, and so that depends on your use case and the data that you're working with, if you can do that. And then control and customization. So if you needed to do any uh, unique transformation or validation steps along the way, then you're kind of out of luck. You're just going to have to use what you would have used anyways, some, some uh, you know, uh, cloud function or Lambda or virtual machine to do that work for you. So then there's self-hosted solutions, and there's, there's a bunch out there. There's also a large graveyard of them. Um, <laughs> Um, one of the ones that survives today is this thing called Pentaho Data Integration. Um, and this has, it's got a GUI you can use. You can see it's got steps for extraction, transformation, and loading. Um, one of the things that uh, it shares, though, uh, or that all self-hosted solutions share, are that they have similar pros and cons. So, for instance, they're all going to be pretty customizable. They're open source. So you can extend or edit the code. You might be able to build new integrations uh, from sources that, that uh, they don't already have. The data is yours. It doesn't live on someone else's servers. And the cons, opposite to what those hosted or proprietary solutions are, is that uh, it takes time to set up. You have to learn a new tool. And it's not going to consider hosting or failover or monitoring or backup for you. You're going to still have to think about all those things. So you kind of have these two different worlds where you can either have a lot of abstraction and no customization, or a lot of customization and no abstraction. So the idea for Masher is that it kind of sits in the middle. Yeah, sits in the middle for this particular use case. Um, right, you're a developer, so you want something that is partially abstracted, but this isn't your main job here. You want to be able to still um, you want to be able to, to still not have to worry about it. What I meant is you're a developer, you want something that is customizable as well as somewhat abstracted, if that makes sense. So just kind of, their measure is in the middle, right? You have less customizable, so uh, all of those self-hosted solutions, more abstracted, less customizable. All of those uh, hosted proprietary solutions, and self-hosted open source solution. Less abstracted, more customizable. So Master is launching a series of resources on Google Cloud Platform. It's made a lot of decisions for you. They may not be the right decisions, um, but, but it enables you to abstract away, extract away some of those decisions so you don't have to worry about it as a developer. So it's a convenience framework at its core. So really, it just says Master Deploy, and then it's going to deploy all the resources necessary for all of those core components uh, that I was going over. Uh, to start this off, we'll have a YAML file, it's just a configuration file you fill out, and then it's going to go and do a bunch of validations and set up those resources for you. So the pros, right, it's customizable, it's abstracted, but not all the way. If something breaks on GCP, you still have to go in and fix it. Uh, it manages archiving and failover, um, but it's not really, one thing I need to add here, it's not really meant for large-scale use cases. So, uh, for instance, it's not going to be able to handle larger complex workflows, right? Um, and the, it makes some decisions about uh, the virtual machine that you're going to use, so the volume or rate of data. And it requires a GCP account uh, if you don't have that. 
So I want to get into actually what those resources are and what the architecture is internally, but before I do that, I just want to make sure we're on the same page about some of those services. Um, so I'm going to kind of pair these with what AWS equivalent it is. We, have a, we use a GCE instance, that's the virtual machine, like an EC2, Google Cloud Storage, that's like S3, Cloud Functions are like Lambdas, uh, BigQuery is a data warehouse, that, that's what we use to send data to, like Redshift, then we have Stack, stack Driver Logging, and that's the monitoring and logging service in GCP, like uh, Amazon's Cloud Watch or Cloud Trail. Um, and then one thing that you also have to know about to understand how MeshWorks is involved. Um, so we wanted some way in which users could provide an input data source without having a lot of code and overhead, but just but kept in line with just filling out that simple YAML file at the beginning. And so in order to help us do that, we chose Embolt. It's an open source tool uh, used by people at, uh, I think, Treasure Data locally in the Bay and created and maintained here. Um, and it's a plugin-based bulk data loader. It's built in JRuby, and it has these input and output gems uh, that, spe that you specify with a YAML file. So you would download those gems. Let's say you download an HTTP gem and a PSQL gem. And now within bulk, you can have, uh, an, have those gems communicate with each other via standard Ruby objects. So in the example here, we have a YAML file. This would be the YAML file that Embolk would use. We have an input and an output type. The input type is HTTP with a URL, method git, and then the output is GCS, Google Cloud Storage, um, the bucket name that you want to send it to, etc. cetera, uh, and yeah, an auth method. Um, and this is actually the YAML file that we generate inside uh, GC instance, and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, and so with this, this allows us to just ask the user, well, just tell us well, where you're pulling data from. We'll set up all the other resources for you. Um, so you run this file. You can run it once, right? So like to pull data from this URL and send it to GCS once. Um, you would, do, you would be in the working directory, in bulk run, and then the name of that YAML file. And that would run, the, run that integration one. So it would pull data, send it to the GCS bucket. However, a lot of data sources, you're gonna wanna do some kind of incremental loading. So for instance, if you're pulling from a PSQL database, you don't wanna load all the data every time. You wanna load only the data that you didn't load the last time you pulled. Um, and so to do that, inside in bulk, inside the YAML file, you can set incremental to true, and then tell it which columns that you want. So created at would be a good one. And then you would do in bulk run, the name of the YAML file, dash C, and the name of a new YAML file. And this will write or overwrite an existing YAML file of that name with the last column that it drew, and that way it always has a simple way to just keep track of state to always know which was the last one pulled. Um, does that make sense? Because um, this is important later about uh, why we have to set up Docker in a certain way. Um, so with this, so and then we use we chose there were other tools out there uh, that I could get into, but Embolk was the one that we chose just because it's well maintained. So, so this is the overall uh, architecture uh, of of what Master sets up for you. So you you have that YAML file at the beginning and you go masher deploy, and it's gonna launch all of these resources. So let's say your input data source in that YAML file was a Postgres database. So it's gonna have in bulk running inside a Docker container on a compute engine, um, and then I'm gonna walk through all of that, but just starting with this first. So, so we have in bulk, this is the tool that we're using to load data, right? Um, and it's hosted inside a Docker container. And the reason why that is is that sometimes um, you know, there will be discontinuations, there will be discontinuations of support for different OSs, so they just discontinued support for Debian and Mate. Um, and so in order to ensure that in the future, whenever we did updates or anything, it was easy to transfer over, we wanted to put install in bulk instead of Docker. So this in bulk file is running that command in bulk run, 
um, or a command specified by the user at the beginning, is running that on a cron job. Wait, yeah. Oh, I just skipped a piece. This is the Docker file that we're actually using. Um, because unlike most uh, containers that are gonna start a process and then stop, uh, this container remains open so that it can run a cron job, and that was a design, design choice that I'll mention in a little bit. Um, but it's running a cron job inside uh, the Docker container. And it pulls that data from the source and sends it to a staging bucket in cloud storage. And I'll get into this archive bucket in a minute. When data is loaded as new line delimited JSON in this staging bucket, it triggers a cloud function. So when you did mesh or deploy at the beginning, the code for this cloud function is actually downloaded to your working directory so that you can make some edits and re-upload it back into the same integration and provide for custom validation or transformations uh, along the way. So cloud function is triggered from this data. It attempts to load it into BigQuery. If the load job is successful, then the data is moved to the archive bucket. So now you have a place where you can go back and look for, um, for audits or compliance reports or anything like that, um, and, or for corrupted data. If the load job is unsuccessful, it's gonna keep it in the staging bucket with a timestamp. So that way you can also always have a record of failing load jobs. And then each part of this process is hooked into Stackdriver, including the output from this cron job um, here. Does it make sense? So it's a convenience framework, so it's really uh, meant to just have a few, few commands. We've got init, which will create a template YAML file that you can then use. Deploy, which will launch all of the GCP resources based off that YAML file after it's been filled out. Destroy, destroys, all of the GCP resources of a specific data pipeline, list, help. So the first one in it, right, it's gonna put into it, it's gonna output, uh, hey, fill out this template I just gave you. So here you can see this is an example uh, empty uh, masher config YAML file. Um, so there's really two different sources, two different chunks here. We've got masher, this is everything that masher needs. So service account, JSON key file, your credentials for GCP, what table and data set you need uh, for a BigQuery. So it's gonna look for this, and if it's not there, it'll create it in BigQuery. Um, integration name that's gonna be used for creating the cloud function and virtual machine and everything else, so you can go and find it. The in bulk run command that I was talking about, you can put in here. And then those gems I was talking about too, you can specify what gems you need for that. And then for in bulk, what input type, the rest of that in bulk YAML file um, will be generated inside the GCE instance. So, so this is an example filled out. Um, you've got all of the integration name, et cetera. And then once you have that in your working directory filled out, you do Masher Deploy. So Masher, uh, so Deploy does a lot of the heavy lifting for you. I don't wanna go into everything that it does just for uh, the sake of time. But uh, as a broad overview, it performs a bunch of local validation. So it's just ensuring like, hey, is this bucket name, is this something that's a valid bucket name in the first place or function name in the first place? Remember, it's taking the integration name that you use to, to generate those resources. Then it's gonna go and check and do remote validations. Actually, yeah. Then it's gonna check and do remote validations. Um, so for instance, the buckets names need to be globally unique. It's gonna make sure it doesn't uh, already exist. It's gonna take the, the cloud functions code, copy it to your working directory so you can add any uh, uh, transformation or validation launches all those GCP resources, and then uh, once that GCE instance is launched, the Docker container is run, uh, and then the cron job starts running. And then destroy. So as the broad overview, Master handles the extraction of data from, uh, from by using in bulk, uh, hosted on Docker on a GCE instance. 
allows for the user to have custom validation and transformation, does staging and archiving through Google Cloud Storage, and uh, publishes to BigQuery, and provides monitoring through Stackdriver for each step of the process. Um, and orchestration and performance doesn't apply as much because we're not dealing uh, with highly complicated workflows, but one thing I would note is that uh, each integration that you launch is wholly separate from each other. So you could have completely different projects that you're using, GCP projects that you're using, or, or even accounts, um, and it would launch it from there. Um, and uh, you could specify for them to go, for instance, to the same data set or table, but then it would be up to the user to worry about conflicts in schema. So I just want to cover three of the challenges that I had running into it um, in building it. Most of them apply to using Docker. Um, the first is just that we're using Docker in a, a little bit of a non-standard way. Um, each, each container that we're running is completely unique because of those gems, because of the run command. Um, and so we build the, instead of pulling the image from, from, uh, from, the, from a, my Docker hub, we build the image inside of it. So to do that, we convert template files that we have uh, in, in Masher, um, interpolate the values from, from, uh, that are provided in the Masher config file into those template files. And then in the startup script on that virtual machine, we copy those files over, we build the, the uh, image from there, which then copy those files into the Docker container, then run the container. Another question that came up was, I was talking about those Docker cron jobs. Um, so right now, the cron job is inside the Docker container itself. And there was a couple of different options we had to do that. You, we could have put a cron job on the virtual machine that the container runs on. I would cross that option out right away just because we're already using Docker, we're trying to move away from any dependencies on the OS. Um, but these two are pretty attractive options. You could put, uh, we could have used Cloud Scheduler, which is GCP's built-in cron service, or have a cron job that runs in a separate container. And those things make sense because just separation of concerns. Um, it, would have, it, it, it's, it would be a good idea to separate those out. You have the container, and then you have the involved uh, running separately. But in our scenario, it made sense to us to do this, to just have a cron job running inside the Docker container itself, because you're really just doing that. You're doing the run command uh, and, and a scheduling service for that run command. In order to do that, I was saying we keep the container running in the background in perpetuity. Um, so to do that, we, we, uh, you need a service that's ongoing. So we have tail f, we're watching a file indefinitely. This is the last command in the Docker file. And then one thing that proved trickier than I felt like it should have been um, was figuring out how to get the output of those cron jobs to Stackdriver. So, uh, so there is a, a Docker logging service for GCP that will take the logs and send them to Stackdriver for you. You can set it up in the run command or you can uh, specify it in the daemon.json file. Um, but, uh, but but doing that alone won't be enough because it doesn't, it's not gonna just automatically capture the output of a cron job. Um, so here, this is what we have. So we put the output of that cron job, goes to a process with an ID of one for standard output and standard error. And that's basically, um, and that's, this is the, actually this is the cron, the script that's used when the cron job is run. So future work. Um, would love to enable cross-platform support. It'd be great if this was available on AWS um, or enabled other target destinations. Maybe you want to do something with that data or maybe you would want a more complicated workflow but still abstract some of the pieces so you, I don't know, send it to Kafka or something. Um, enable users to authenticate with OAuth. Right now you got to go in and download that key file. I feel like the more we can abstract away, the more it kind of makes sense for this particular use case. Um, automatic schema pre-check. So right now, if, if uh, the schema doesn't match what you have in BigQuery in that table, um, and you've already created a table, uh, then it's just gonna fail. It'd be great if it just kind of told you ahead of time that that was gonna happen. Uh, and, then, and then lastly, so right now, if you, let me go back to that slide, where is that, there it is. So right now, um, 
The Docker container I didn't mention, but this has a restart policy of true. If it shuts down, it's going to start back up. And it has a volume attached where it keeps those files that it needs. So if this crashes, we're okay. If this crashes, it's done. So <laughs> this is a single point of failure right now. And that's just a factor of, um, that's just a factor of limited time. Uh, since I, since uh, I was basically uh, doing this project on my own dime and had a set period of time. But I would like to explore some other options um, Kubernetes or some kind of auto scaling group that would enable us to uh, to have uh, some some failover options there. Cool. So that's me. I'm not going to put that up. <laughs> but um, yeah. So this is the broad overview. Um, are there any questions that people have? Yeah. Um, how does it manage like states? For example, like if you mentioned that if that uh, a Docker container goes away. Yeah. Then how do you know that where actually needs to start again extracting or Well so so remember um, when we do like the when we're running an in bulk job and we can do in bulk run you the, the diff right, right the right. diff file yeah. right so the diff file is kept so the diff file is in the volume that's attached to the Docker container and so that's actually keeping track of that file. So even if this container is uh, you know, crashes for some reason, it's going to have, it has, with that restart policy, it's going to start back up and use the same volume and pick up where it left off. Does that make sense? But, but it's not like uh, HA or anything like that. It's, it's just always a single container. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. So what exactly does this uh, cloud function is doing here? Right? This? It's, it has two, two functions, really. One is that we know that we want to have some place where we're putting data beforehand for debugging and for compliance and audit reports. Um, so this cloud function is just take, is triggered by data. So it's one of its main roles is just loading data. But the other big one is that the code for this cloud function is available locally to the user so that they could add like those custom validations or transformations on the data that they want. Um, and all they would have to do is edit a Node.js file, re-upload it. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Two, yeah. What about multiple data sources that need to be joined? Yeah. So um, ideally, I mean, so right now, it only works, this is the way it works, so it's like it's gonna pull something from here, and whatever the user specifies, it will go to, it will send it to. Um, but if you wanted the data in the same table, so like, like that? Like, yeah, if you pulled a piece of information right. from Amazon and a piece of information from yeah. MailChimp, and if you wanted in your BigQuery database, those yeah. two to be kind of joined into yeah. the same table. And the way that Masher works right now, it would just, it would be up to the user. You could do one of two things. I think the ideal solution for just the way that it's set up for now, you would specify two different tables and do whatever you need to do inside BigQuery to, to join it. Um, you could, in theory also, have them go to the same table and define the schema of that table to match uh, both. Would it be able to do an update, update, like if they have the same primary key or some, some sort of key that defines, like you, you run the first load and you're mm -hmm. running on your populating only three columns, right. and now you want to populate the fourth column of a row that already exists. You can, if I'm understanding correctly, you can change the schema after loading data. Is that, so you could add, you could add further columns that match the second data source that you wanted to add. Mm -hmm. But you would need to be updating a row, not loading a row, like yes. inserting a row. Yes, so yes, and you would need to do that before, and it won't do it for you. Okay. Yeah, great. That can go in a cloud function like <laughs> Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Good. Yeah, to do it every time. But you know, yeah. So uh, can you define what is small application initial? Yeah. You know, what is what is that mean? Is it like a implementation or, or Yeah. I mean the biggest the biggest uh, bottleneck here is gonna be the size, like how much data can this thing handle? Um, because this is fine. This is gonna handle lots of data. Everything else is okay. But, but the VM, and I forget what the limit is on what we have, but it's not gonna be huge. Um, but more than enough for, for your average small size web app. Um, yeah, that's poorly defined, I should add that. 
but that's a good question. I could I could definitely follow up in the comments. Yeah. So well, what about the credential security? Where do you store it? Um, for your GCP account? No, uh, for the source, for example, Postgres, uh, where I use already password. Is, so for, let's say, the Postgres database? Yeah. Yeah, that's in the YAML file. Okay. So, so in, uh, what was that? So in the YAML file itself, you would have to put in, in the input type, actually that's not it. Um, this one. So this is the master config file. So if you were doing input type of PSQL, there would be a place to put those credentials. And then it would be stored in the Docker container inside the GC instance. Yeah. Inside the container. Yeah. So anybody with access to that container would have access to, to or to that GCE instance mm -hmm. would have access to it. So second question, what if I just want to use the masher just for transformation and move it somewhere else? Mm -hmm. Can the whole thing be just a transient store till the transformation happens? Mm -hmm. right? So, tell me again. So in terms of data security again, mm -hmm. if I just want to use the whole thing just for loading, transformation, move it to somewhere else other than the query, yeah. can the whole thing be configured such that it doesn't store any data after the transformation is done? Yes, but it would require, like not as it is currently built. Okay. But it wouldn't, it, I could see it, I could see uh, a fork happening would be too hard. Yeah. Maybe you could write like a call function again to mm -hmm. push it to wherever you want. Oh yeah. But the staging but then still has the it. Staging it. Right, it's still here. It's fine. Yep. Oh I see. Yeah. So what was your motivation for this? So um, a little bit ago I worked at a statewide nonprofit mm -hmm. which at, as an engineer um, but which is remarkably like a startup. Uh, they're always thirsty for cash. They don't always know what they're gonna do tomorrow, <laughs> right? Uh, everybody's running around um, and you take on a lot of different roles. And, uh, and we had data all over the place. So text messaging, uh, we had like three different CRMs and then social media and all this stuff. And it was really critical. We were doing voter mobilization and engagement. So it's really critical to get that data in one place so that you can actually do analysis. And it was always this job of adding new sources or doing stuff. And so when I had time, I was excited about like, be great if I just could press a button, deploy, you know, each time. It's very interesting because like, you know, so everyone talks about the volume, but like, you know, there are yeah. small applications, like a small mom, mom and pop store, yeah. like, you know, using 10 different uh, right. cloud Absolutely. services. Yeah. So they want to do some small scale analytics. Yeah. Like, you know, this is probably a good one. Yeah. Yeah, and that was the idea is that well fits my use case, but actually it seems like that fits like a lot of use cases in particular. Um, and particularly if you're if you're a developer, like so that you could you could do I could go in, I can edit this code and do something else with it if I really want. Like so. Um, or um, I could also change something that happens inside of it, or just you know, use what it is and then do whatever transformations I need. Appreciate that affirmation too. So, <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, do you have experience with some of the things that the feature is getting older, or this by the older that you are going to be? Oh no, there there isn't. If I was gonna say, so the the question was just so you heard if, if there was any order to the future work. Go back to this slide. Yeah. If there was any order to this, uh, there is not. And right now, so I start a new job on the 22nd, so I just know I'm gonna try and be, um, I'm, I'm not gonna work on it for a little bit. <laughs> but I want to, I like doing it, you know, like and it was a fun project. Um, if I was gonna do it, honestly, the thing that I am, that would be more or less is enabling cross-platform support, even though that would, enable so many more users, it's just, it's actually the biggest chunk of work. Um, uh, and the thing that I would think is most important is uh, ensuring that there's some failover strategy for the GC instance. I think that that's sort of like the weak link in the chain and just the, the easiest route to pick. Um, and, uh, and then the other ones, the redeploy command, actually I think is 
something that's not too hard to do, but it's pretty meaningful. And that would just allow you to overwrite existing integrations um, altogether. Um, and I think that that would be, that would be useful. Yeah. Well, was there a specific reason you went to GCP first? Um, so there's two. So like one, one is just that GCP does a great job marketing itself as data analytics. Um, and so it seems like the people, the use case in some ways doesn't really specify it doesn't say that the people using this right are like data analytics professionals, but I feel like this is the place that a lot of people will reach for. Um, and there are some other reasons that we were just, this is, I don't, I don't think I said at the beginning, this is two friends of mine also worked on this project with me, Linus Fan in LA and Max Sox in, Matt Sox in Portland. Um, but, the re, but the other reason is we were just excited about learning GCP a little bit more and had familiar with AWS. Um, and so I'd like to do, I'd like to, so that was actually a big reason is just trying to ensure that we knew it and that required doing a lot of research to ensure that we were using the right services and everything. Yeah. yeah. One thing I would like to suggest is like, you know, if you're a big query, yeah. you should also consider putting the data into Google Sheets. Yeah. So. It makes sense for the, yeah, makes sense for the use case. Yeah. I had uh, actually there was a partner nonprofit that just their whole database was pretty much like Google Sheets. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Nobody nobody can beat Excel, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, uh, thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity as well. Really appreciate it. And, uh, yeah.